We've created this scenario. We have pushed people for too long. We've said above and beyond without any delineation of what above and beyond looks like. We've dangled carrots for some people that they've never gonna achieve because there's barriers to being able to achieve that. We have women disproportionately impacted in the pandemic because they have to be working this 20 extra hours per week in unpaid labor, which we haven't solved for societally. So, you know, there is a reason why this is happening happening. And so employees are saying, I've changed my relationship with work. My social contract with work has changed. I'm no longer going to pursue a carrot that I don't even know if I want. And so you're going to have to, to, to adjust to what my needs are now. And it's a revolution. Everyone's talking about the metaverse these days, but workplace from meta is different. I mean, the clues in the name, right? Workplace is a business communication tool that uses features like instant messaging and video calls to help people share information. Think Facebook, but for your company. It's part of Meta's vision for the future of work, a future in which your job isn't just something you do, but something you experience. And if you've been listening to this show, you know that experience is something that I am very passionate about and talk about a lot. Workplace from Meta is creating a future in which we'll all feel more present, connected, and productive. You can learn more and start your journey into the future of work at workplace.com forward slash future. Again, that's workplace.com forward slash future. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Leading the Future of Work. My guest today, Jennifer Moss, she's the author of a book called The Burnout Epidemic, The Rise of Chronic Stress and How We Can Fix It. A very timely topic. Jennifer, thank you for joining me. I am so thrilled to be here. Yes, you're right. It's uh, relevant, I think, for a lot of us, uh, including me. <laughs> yes. And I was going to say, including me, including my wife, including pretty much everybody I know. Um so let's start kind of high level with why did you decide to write a book and what was some of the research that went into the book? Well, you know, it's circuitous. I started out working with, um, you know, with organizations in this data research technology company that I co-founded with my husband, actually. And oh. we... That yeah, could be a whole separate was, podcast. Yeah. And led yeah. to my burning out for sure. Um, you know, one of the... the reasons that it's tough to get funded when you're a married co-founder and you're a female co-founder. There's just so many different barriers to that. And that leads yeah. to a lot of burnout. And I know that um, for me, you know, working in this space, we were also a bit ahead of our time. We were, this is gosh, 2010. And we're looking at happiness in workplaces. And at that point, they sort of were rolling their eyes about the topic. Workplace well-being had become, a, you know, a massive cottage industry around wellness products for work. And so we were coming and saying, this is really important. But I started to feel a bit fraudulent because not only was I really stressed out, but also we were attacking the problem really too far downstream around you know, social emotional intelligence and psychological fitness. Yeah. And I found that there was maybe about 20% of each organization I'd work with that were open to this and they were engaged and they were optimizing because they already got that, you know, in, in, intuitively and they were well. Um, but then you have this huge swath of the workforce that's feeling overwhelmed. Their workload's unsustainable. They're they're dealing with discrimination. I mean, there's lack of community inside of their organizations. They're not getting paid well enough. I mean, these hygiene issues weren't being addressed. And so I think my own experience in, in this role of an entrepreneur and my burnout, and then also understanding what companies were experiencing, um, I decided I wanted to sort of focus more further upstream. So I flipped from being an happiness expert to an unhappiness expert and, you know, with the same goal, I think, is get helping people to feel more well and healthy. Yeah. And, and so when you decided that this is a book that you wanted to write, can you share a little bit about some of the research? What did you do to get the, uh, the findings, the insights, the data that, that you actually were able to collect? So I've been collecting it, just working within organizations and with, um, you know, policy work. I started 
really trying to understand the impact of well-being and wellness on the world as part of the the Glo- global happiness council and they're actually part of the, focusing on UN sustainable development goals and I was yeah. looking at it from a research standpoint and I started in that around 2000 and three or sorry, 2013, 2014, and working with economists and really interesting researchers all around the world trying to solve this problem around, you know, chronic stress and unhappiness, the WHO is involved. Yeah. And and the, we just kept hitting the same sort of patterns, you know, nothing was changing. And, you know, we're trying to affect engagement and the numbers continue even just in this last year to be lower than they ever have before. And, uh, you know, and then I started digging into my own research, pulling people together, like Christina Maslach, Dr. Maslach and Dr. Michael Leiter, and working with them to understand what people were feeling. Um, and then writing about it and researching it as a journalist for maybe four or five years before the pandemic oh. struck. And then uh, I actually started writing the book before the pandemic hit. And, oh, um, okay. And yeah, which was curious. Um, so I started writing it. I was I was already saying this is a problem. We should pay attention. But you know, would not have imagined that the pandemic would be such a boost to my career. Sadly and yeah. unfortunately, um, you know, I say both and. Anthony, Dr. Anthony Fauci and I were, you know, surprised by the experience of the pandemic on our careers. Um, but that's one of the things that ended up shape shifting was okay. I've got to scrap a lot of words and yeah. sort of start fresh because everything was so new and rapidly changing and evolving. And I think I rewrote the book. I don't know how many times in the intro. I don't know how many times until it was in word lock. And I still miss <laughs> things like. <laughs> Yeah, like I just wanted to add more and the great resignation and quiet quitting has happened since. So this is definitely, there's a part two uh, in play for sure. Do you think that the pandemic has accelerated burnout? I I definitely uh, see it as um, a major accelerant, actually. I said we were already at a boiling point. It was a problem. uh, And we were about to be exposed for it. I think there was going to be something that happened to expose this issue, but having something happen so global and collectively sharing an experience so traumatic for a lot of people. And, and also just the fact that we sped up the future of work so rapidly, the adoption of everything in our lives was so rapid. And then you're, you're trying to do this with the pairing of family life and, you know, just this increase of infiltration in the home. I mean, it was like, you know, the, it was boiling and then we just turned the burner up to high and then everything blew up. Yeah, it's interesting. So I kind of heard both sides on this, right? So, you know, I've heard the side of like, you know, employees are getting burned out, they're getting tired and frustrated and unhappy. And then I've also heard the side on uh, a lot of leaders that I interview who say that employees are just being unreasonable. They're asking for things that are not sustainable. They want more money than a company can pay. They want entry level employees want equity now in companies. They don't want to show up to the office. So it's kind of like this tug of war between employees who are kind of wanting, you know, they're trying to ask for as much as they can get and organizations that are saying, well, you know, it's not sustainable. We can't, (laughs) we can't pay you that amount of money. Like we can't do that for you and everybody else who works here. It's not a sustainable model. And so I'm curious to hear your take on this because it seems like there is not really a balance at the moment between what organizations are comfortable doing versus what employees are asking for. Are, Are you seeing that too? I think that whenever there is an opportunity for people to be capitalists, they're going to take it in some circumstances. And I think it's ironic that, you know, these organizations that have been highly capitalistic for decades um, are now frustrated that their employees are acting in the same way that they have been acting for a long time. And I think- you know, it's it's a provocative statement, and I, and I work with lots of leaders to say, you know, we've created this scenario. We have pushed people for too long. We've said above and beyond without any delineation of what above and beyond looks like. We've dangled carrots for some people that they've never going to achieve because there's barriers to being able to achieve that. We have women disproportionately impacted in the pandemic yeah. because they have to be working this 20 extra hours per week in unpaid labor, which which we haven't solved for societally. So, you know, there is a reason why this is happening. And so employees are saying, 
I've changed my relationship with work. My social contract with work has changed. I'm no longer going to pursue a carrot that I don't even know if I want. Yeah. And so you're going to have to to, to adjust to what my needs are now. And it's a revolution. It's sort of like rule to work in the 70s where really bad labor practices really rose up unions and people saying, I'm not going to be treated this way anymore. And so this idea that, you know, now I'm really frustrated that these people are capitalizing on this opportunity. It just seems pretty tone deaf to me. <laughs> Yeah, it's sort of like uh, reap what you sow. This is the environment that you created where you push people and tried to get as much as you can for them for so long. You fired people when your business wasn't going well. You had at will employment. You, you know, you treated employees however you wanted. And now you're kind of upset that employees want more from you. Well, that's kind of your problem. <laughs> It, it it is. I mean, it, and it's blunt and it's provocative, and you know, and and I work on with both sides to try to get you know a really happy yeah. marriage of that relationship. But I think until we have, you know, it, we get out of the state of denial, then nothing's really going to get solved. And just saying, let's jam the toothpaste back in the war in the tube and get workers back to work, and that's how it has to be, and deal with it, and and being surprised by that you know, the reaction of people quitting, I think, or quietly quitting, I think is, um, it's just naive. We've changed. We've, we've changed. Yeah. It's interesting because we saw, I think it was Elon Musk. And there were a couple of companies that were basically like, get back into the office full time. I don't care if you don't, if you're not back in the office, find another job, <laughs> which was, <laughs> and then you had people like Malcolm Gladwell, who was like, what are you doing with your life? If you don't show up to the office and you're just working at home in your pajamas, like he, <laughs> Your life is meaningless. And, uh, you know, both of those people got quite a lot of, uh, of backlash for it. Um, but I mean, I, you know, I always try to see both sides. Like, I also understand leaders who are saying, look, we, we value in-person work. Um, you know, we, we do have a job. We do have a business. So, I, I mean, I, I try to understand both, both sides of, of, you know, where the organizations are coming from and where the employees are coming from, too. But I agree. I mean, it's, it's really hard to find that balance. And for many, many decades, organizations could basically do whatever they wanted. And now employees are like, well, now it's, you know, now it's our turn to get a couple punches at the bag. <laughs> That is exactly what's happening. And I and I think that we have swung the pendulum really far in one direction. Yeah. And it, that isn't necessarily a sustainable place to be either. So I'm not really recommending that this kind of revolutionary behavior is what we need to see in the future of work. I think we need to pause and say, okay, where are we at odds? I, I personally feel like fully remote work works for some, but a lot of people have come um, to make remote work habitual and they don't realize why they're lonely, why they feel like their career is atrophying, why they don't feel inspired, um, why they feel disconnected, which loneliness is a byproduct of remote work and this last couple of years has escalated and people are yeah. the loneliest they've ever felt. So there's a benefit of looking at each other in the eye. There's a real danger to constantly being in these meetings virtually. And we need to start thinking, okay, so this isn't working over here for employers. There's way too you know many demands from employees, but employees don't actually know exactly what is good for them either in every circumstance. So how do we come to a compromise? And a Goldilocks zone is really what we should be aiming for, you know, yeah. that just right zone. And that's going to take some effort. But I mean, let's think about hybrid differently. Let's think about the office differently. Maybe it's not the place that you physically go to do the same thing that you would do at home. Maybe it becomes a place of play and levity and interaction and collaboration and ideation. I mean, maybe we think about what that place looks like, what that hmm. other place looks like, and and reestablish what the future of an office could look like so that it makes it compelling for people to want to yeah. be there. Um, and that's yeah. the kind of thinking we need to start to deploy. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I, um, you know, I still think there's value in person work. I mean, I think it also depends on the tasks that you do. I mean, I have a fully virtual team. Um, I mean, a lot of my team does task-based work, like very specific. I, I mean, if I had a big company, for example, you know, thousands of employees, I think if your expectation was that you wanted to grow and move into a leadership role where you are responsible for motivating and inspiring others, then your role would probably, you know, 
require a little bit more of the in-person stuff because part of your role is to be around people and to you know motivate them inspire them coach them not to say that it's impossible to do in a virtual environment but it's not quite the same um, but I think if, for example, you're doing just task-based work, picking up the phone, responding to emails, you know, and you're content with that and you don't want or don't care about kind of growing into kind of a leadership kind of role, then yeah, that's fine for you. But at least for me, I think it's very, very hard to grow inside of a medium or even a larger size company if you never have a physical presence and nobody ever sees you, whereas one of your counterparts is in the office and they you know th that person is getting coffees with their leader they are having casual conversations and chats they are brainstorming ideas and you're just behind a, a screen and you don't get any of that so I, I i mean i totally agree with you i think there's a lot of value to the in-person work it's not to say that everything needs to be done that way but you know depending on the work that you're doing there's still value in it yeah and i think the uh, benefit um, um positive byproduct of the pandemic was realizing that we can work yeah. remote and that we're capable of it. And I do think, you know, there's different ways to be thinking about it and it doesn't need to be the same. We haven't declared that hybrid means two days in and three days out. And, you know, that's what it's supposed to look like. I mean, the idea that, you know, we make it so that it's so flexible that it actually counteracts what the benefits would be. And I say this for those that are in, you know, uh, very marginal roles or at risk um, roles or they're females. I mean, w women of color, for example, were really hard hit. If you're asking anyone to come in whenever they want, then you see more people that have the ability to do that to come in. And so then we're going to see more exclusion of certain groups because they don't have the same ability yeah. or access. And so we want to make it where it's very clear. Open text, for example, is um, you know in various different departments based on tasks, but they have some of their senior people that do need to collaborate, come in, they fly them in once a quarter for you know three to four days and they bond and they hang out and they connect and then they go back to their other prospective homes and work remotely and then they fly them back in. I mean, they can work differently for different types of personalities and uses, but when we kind of make it non in like uh formalized when we make it too much up to the employee, then what ends up happening is actually it's not helping them. It's potentially hindering their advancement in the company. Yeah. Uh, well, before we get into burnout, maybe the last thing we could talk about is quiet quitting. That's kind of been like a new, uh, a relatively new theme and topic that, that's been coming out. And for people not familiar with it, it basically um, is kind of like checking out, like doing the bare minimum at work and not going above and beyond. And you're sort of like, you've you've mentally quit but you're physically there is kind of the way that i think about it it's not like you're purposely tanking and doing a terrible job at everything but you're just kind of like kind of coasting doing the bare minimum and there too i've heard both sides of the debate right um i think it was adam grant who was like i think he said something along the lines of quiet quitting is a result of like bad bosses and organizations who don't challenge their people and on the flip side, I've heard leaders say, well, quiet quitting is a result of employees not speaking up, not asking for more, not saying they want more responsibility or more challenges. And it's kind of, you know, who's responsible for the quiet quitting? Uh, so I'm curious to hear your take on that. Well, I definitely think that people that have um, been quiet quitting and what they what I've been, you know, hearing and I've been interviewing it a lot because I'm writing a bunch of pieces on it lately. And what I keep finding is that people are saying, I'm just burned out. I'm really burned out. And I have been pursuing sort of this carrot or this idea of promotion or reward, and I'm not getting recognized for it. People are so busy and so tired that they're sort of just putting work on me and I'm not getting any value for that. No. Um, it's been sort of two or three years that I've been doing the same job. And because of COVID, no one's really talking about succession planning or advancement. And so I think maybe right now I want to just do what I'm supposed to do and be continue to, to produce at the expectation that has been defined for me. But no, I'm not going to answer emails now after work and after hours. And no, I'm not going to go to those extra, you know, uh, choose if you want to training sessions, you know, that you can decide to opt into because it makes you look good or going to those networking events so you can be seen, you know, we're not, I'm not going to do that because I'm finding that even when I did work 60, 70 hours a week, it didn't really get me anywhere. And so I think what's happened is people are just 
disengaged. And yeah. we see disengagement, it really is sort of a very similar description of what quiet quitting is. And so we have to kind of deal with the disengagement piece, the burnout piece before we can re-inspire and re-energize. And we should be as leaders really evaluating, you know, who are the people that we see are quiet quitting? Are they people that have worked really, you know, hard in the past? Have they been really competitive and inspired and passionate and then all of a sudden they're just not well that's probably because they're chronically stressed yeah. and we misdiagnose that often so it's not every case there's going to be people that you know are disengaged and actively disengaged and don't really care but we tend to create a lot of policies and discussion around the 10 or 15 percent that take advantage but there's a big swath of people that are really in that middle bucket where they're pretty tired and yeah. they haven't seen the fruits of their labor yet yeah no i i agree and i i think that's a very great way to to think about it and and it's a good transition into what i wanted to talk about next which is burnout um so what, what is the the definition that you use for burnout well i follow the who definition the world health organization and that's um that it's workplace or institutional stress left unmanaged it's in the it's an occupational phenomena it's not in the life um aspect of chronic stress it's specific to workplace and institutional stress and it shows up in three major signs high level of depletion so frequent levels of sort of exhaustion at the end of the day maybe not wanting to get up in the morning because you're so tired and you don't feel like you're engaged and want to go to work uh, maybe you're drinking more coffee or red bull in the day because you don't feel like you can you know stay motivated and maybe you're using downers at night like alcohol which we've seen a lot of uh, you're not engaging in your hobbies outside of work so you're sort of in that level of exhaustion where you're also emotionally distanced from work which is disengagement essentially the sort of the according to maslow's sort of or, or Dr. Maslach's MBI, Maslach Burnout Inventory, the antithesis essentially of burnout is engagement. So we're seeing that right now. And then um, and then cynicism, a sense of hopelessness. Uh, and that, that really is something that we're seeing more of and the cynicism piece has really increased lately. So th that's sort of how I define it. And it is important that they distinguish this in 2019 in a joint research with the ILO when they found out after six years of a meta study, a massive analysis that 750,000 people die from overwork alone wow. every single year, every year. So they wanted to make a point. They added it, WHO added it to their international classification of diseases, made a point to say it's really serious. And I think that's so that we can have more accountability to, to the issue. Yeah. So what I wanted to ask you is, um, burnout's like a real thing because some people, you know, there's some people who are like, Oh, burnout is, you're just tired. You know, it's not like a real medical thing. It's just your way of saying that you need a break, but it's actually a real legitimate thing. It's recognized. There are symptoms, there are causes. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a legitimate thing that people go through. Yeah. And I love that you are establishing and reinforcing that because for us, you know, a long time and still to this day, this idea that, you know, burnout and it, it has actually been uh, defined as a whiny millennial problem, which exactly. It's like, it's not real. <laughs> yeah. Walk it off. Like, I know. And this is Jill Lepore, you know, someone that's really well established writing this. And then, you know, the, the New Yorker, like these are people that are saying, that we trust that that is just whiny millennials and it's and and even just saying like we don't have religion anymore and this is why we're you know we're we're burning out i mean just really kind of wacky things about um this serious very serious uh syndrome that is caused by you know root causes like overwork mm -hmm. systemic discrimination lack of fairness lack of community like all of these things that are very seriously contributing to it and so i think you know, what we need to understand, especially in Sweden, they call it extreme exhaustion disorder, and it can lead to PTSD, chronic illness, suicide. I mean, that's why we need to, like, I, when we finally started talking about mental illness, it was really helpful. And I think burnout is just this next wave of that. Workplace is a business communication tool from Meta. Think Facebook, but for your company. It's part of Meta's vision for the future of work. A future in which we'll all feel more present, connected, and productive. Start your journey into the future of work 
at workplace.com forward slash future. Again, that's workplace.com forward slash future. How do you know if you are suffering or somebody on your team is getting burned out versus just tired? Like what's the, what's the difference between just, you know, maybe being a little overworked versus legitimately like you got to stop? Yeah, you see that in signs like they're withdrawing, they're more argumentative, maybe more volatile than they used to not be before, but all of a sudden it's very conflict-based, your discussions and communications with them. Uh, they look, you know, like they're extremely tired. You can kind of see it in your yeah. physical demeanor. Um, people start to complain of stomach problems, like they're sick more, they're late more, and they're having a hard time getting motivated, um, they're making more mistakes. I mean, we've seen this specifically even in, in coders and software programmers where you start to see this depletion happening with burnout and, and then there's a lot of errors in the code. I mean, we want to be tracking sort of if that person was this sort of high energy, healthy, happy person, and then you've seen them as the workload has increased, that they've started to get more and more depleted. We don't want to misdiagnose them as underperforming. We want to probably think that they are really uh, burnt or at risk of burnout and getting to the point where they're going to hit that wall. Um, and I think one of the also the really interesting things that we found in the language of the research is you're starting to hear more languages, uh, language of permanence. So people starting mm -hmm. to say things like always and never, um, you know, it's always going to be like this, I like that hopeless language. And then yeah. I using a lot of I words where people are sort of inside themselves a lot, very myopic thinking. So those are all signs to look out for and appear. Okay. And what's the impact of burnout? Um, you know, because sometimes people just say, oh, you know, you're fine, just power through it. But the reality is that the burnout has a significant impact just on you as a human being, probably on your team, uh, everything that you're a part of. So what are the actual negative impacts of burnout if you just kind of ignore it and try to power through? Well, from a business and a performance standpoint, if you're someone that is a high performing person, it can be really difficult on your confidence to start to be making mistakes all the time and having brain fog and not being able to concentrate. Yeah. You have to work harder to be able to get to those same goals. So you're sort of in this constant state of toxic productivity, which is exhausting. So from a business standpoint, there's that impact. And obviously leaders don't want people feeling like that because that's not good for morale and also bottom line. But from a personal standpoint, individual standpoint, when you actually track sort of the pattern of someone who is experiencing symptoms of burnout, it's usually like this 18 months to two year timeline where- oh, okay. you know, yeah, where you can kind of, I mean, and some folks have better, you know, I guess stamina against chronic stress than others, but I mean, really, and it's not a stamina thing. Like you should be proud if you've been able to work under these conditions for four years versus someone who can only work under them for eight months. But what it is, is that you sort of hit these thresholds and kind of like a happiness set point, you bounce down, but then you rebound up to where you can manage it. But there's a point where all those symptoms start to go from pebbles to a boulder. And when you hit a wall, uh, Dr. Maria Asberg, who's based out of Stockholm, what she says is that you hit a wall and you fall way down and there's the set point is just really hard to get back up to. So you're dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, you're dealing with um, depression and anxiety. So burnout and depression and anxiety aren't the same thing depression, anxiety can become a symptom, an outcome of burnout. Okay. So you get, there's depression, there's anxiety, and then you could have, you know, um, a requirement of therapeutics, of pharmacological treatment, cognitive behavioral therapy. And that can take, if you hit that wall, like if we get to that point where we've fallen off the cliff, it's about the same amount of time of recovery. So it can be 18 months to two years wow. to get fully back. And that's why we don't want it to get to that point. And, you know, and we've seen that where why we've seen so many people quitting and not even going to another job there, the, and the number of mental health disability claims is the highest it's been in workforce history right now. So people might not show where they're quitting, but they're actually inside the company, but on long-term mental health disability. So that's what happens. You can be off work for, for a long time if you get this, uh, unwell. So you, you said around 18 months to two years. So this isn't just something where you show up to work and you're like, ah, I feel burned out today. This is something that usually um, manifests through like ongoing 
you, you know, you feel like this for a certain amount of time and it's, it, it takes time to develop. It's not just you show up to work one day and say, I feel burned out. No, it's an evolution. And actually, if you look at the timeline of the great resignation versus the start of the pandemic, it's almost lockstep to, um, you know, to that timeline where yeah. people are, it was about two years, you know, of people just being in the trenches and then 41% of the global workforce decided that they were going to quit in the next three months. So that is a, a definite, a, you know, a great, um, you know, parallel to what we talk about in the research is that you can sustain it, you can sustain it, you can keep going with it. There's, and there's loyalty that kicks in, like, I don't want to leave my boss or leave my, my friends behind, my co coworkers. Um, and then there is literally a point where you have no more capacity. You have no more neural capacity, physical capacity, emotional capacity, and you have to leave um, and take a break or change things up. But what we're seeing when we see this reshuffle is that people are leaving one burnout situation for another, thinking mm -hmm. that it's actually going to be better for them to leave. So the people that actually took time off or sabbaticals or had the privilege and the financial ability to take time away are the ones that will be able to be more likely to um, you know, stay in another organization in a more sustainable way after they return to work. Yeah, I try to, um, I mean, as you know, when you work for yourself, you feel like you should be working all the time. So I'm constantly trying to like yeah. do stuff, you know, weekends, relax, like just to make sure that I'm not constantly um, working all the time because it's very, very easy to do. Yeah. Um, what are some of the causes of burnout? In the book, you talk about uh, six causes, which I think are very important to kind of identify so you know what, you know, <laughs> what is it that can make you feel this way? So maybe we can go through each one of these causes for one to two minutes. Sure. Yes. So overwork, I think we all know that one, yep. unsustainable workloads. Um, and that's a, probably going to always be the leading cause of burnout is, is unsustainable workloads. Um, and then lack of agency. So not feeling like you have autonomy. We've seen a lot more of that with just more micromanagement, you know, inc increase in bossware and things like that, which are making people feel like they have no control. Um, we're seeing that now with people just saying, come back into the office, not feeling like the rules make sense for some. And it's just arbitrary, that feeling of not having autonomy, even just not having autonomy to get to your goals. So really, you know, managers following your process versus thinking about, you know, you just getting there and giving you that authority yeah. to get there. Um, lack of pay uh, and or sort of reward and recognition essentially, but it's basically like, are you being paid commensurately? But also all the overtime, we see this as nurses and, you know, and first responders and police officers working these unbelievably unsustainable overtime hours and that being not necessarily commensurate with what they should be getting paid. And also just recognition. A lot of people are not feeling recognized. People are too tired to say thank you literally these days. So that's a problem. Um, lack of community. So are, you know, it could be anything from just feeling bullied at work to being excluded. You know, we see a lot of these wellness programs, like even these, you know, steps challenges for people with mobility issues. That's not necessarily inclusive. So othering of people and also, yeah. you know, even just isolation and loneliness, people feeling really disconnected from their teams and not feeling part of something. Um, it's also lack of, um, re uh, values and mismatch. That's another one uh, where you're feeling like you're, you used to love what you do or used to feel good. Like you knew what you were good at. You had mastery. Yeah. And you're burning out. So you don't feel like you have any um, mastery and that, that lack of self-efficacy is a big one and just not fitting, you know, not feeling like you fit. And then, you know, the lack of fairness piece, and that's just discriminatory behavior in the workplace. Okay. But we've also that a lot with, you know, women, like I said, and women of color inside of this pandemic, they've felt this lack of fairness in their ability to do their job while being expected to juggle their home life. Okay. Are there, when you look at these causes, is there one that is most common or most impactful, uh, one that shows up more than others? Because it seems like from all of them, and and hopefully somebody isn't, you know, being smacked with all six at the same time. Uh, but when you look, look at all these, how would you kind of prioritize them in terms of which one has the most significant impact of burnout and which one is most common inside of companies? 
Workload is number one. Always you see that this overwork, the amount of hours people are working that are working are creeping up. And I think the lack of agency and the overwork come in really hand in hand because what we're seeing right now is that, you know, there's some countries, even Canada right now has instituted the the right to disconnect law, which makes it unlawful for you to connect Mm -hmm. with people after hours. And so we're starting to see these psychosocial policies take place. Interesting. Across the world. Yeah. And France started in 2016 and other, you know, Scotland, other um, countries have followed along and Canada has adopted it now. But what what is a, a sort of that's a one example of many. But what we're finding is that when you feel like you have to respond at 11 o'clock at night and have an answer by the next morning or you don't have real protection in that space that's already been really infiltrated, that lack of agency can just you know, fuel this cortisol response. You know, you get a ping at a certain time of night from your phone. You just feel this with this urgency. We have this sense of urgency constantly to respond. And that overwork piece, the toxic productivity and the lack of agency, those two things, those three things sort of have really um, made it very difficult for us to even take pauses and breaks. I mean, we're filling up any extra time that we have with work. Commuting time used to be just you know, listening to the radio and it sucked, which I don't, you know, recommend anyone having to commute. It's terrible too. But like, why didn't we just take that time as time back? But no, we've looked at it as let's fill all of our time with work when we can. And and that's really been disastrous in the yeah. last year. Is there a difference in burnout for leaders versus non-leaders? So basically an individual contributor who's working at an organization versus a leader who is responsible for a team of people. Are, are there any differences there as far as what causes burnout? You know, there's. it's interesting because in the data, we really saw that the more tenure you had, the more agency you had, the better you were able to say, I can't take on that project. Middle managers, though, are sandwiched in particular um, between... The, their boss and trying then to be able to communicate to their team, even if they agree or not, they're saying yes. And it's hard to say yeah. no to their boss. Yeah, I'll take that project on. And then having to message that to the team who, you know, almost hates you at this point because you keep loading work on them. They play, they have a really difficult role that they've had to play in this last year. So this idea of us and them has been frustrating for me because really it's way, way at the top that a lot of these decisions are being made. And so this idea that that middle manager all of a sudden has all the autonomy in the world to say, no, I'm not going to ask my team to do that um, is sort of unfair. But so they're dealing with that. But we are seeing demographically that our younger workforce is the most burned out. They're the most impacted. Interesting. And a lot of that, yeah, and a lot of it has to do, again, we say this whiny millennial problem, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's a, you know, high control, low agency role. They, they are sort of, they have to do what they're told, been told to do. They're trying to establish their brand and who they are. They don't have the seniority. They also haven't been like, um, haven't been at the company for a long time. So they have, haven't proven that they are a hard worker yet, or that they are the creative one or the innovative one or whatever that is that they, you create after 15, you know, years in an organization, they haven't established that. And then they've also come off of student debt and they have no frame of reference. So there's, you know, they're coming at this as their first job potentially in the last few years. And this is nothing like, you know, we've ever experienced before. And you've really tired leaders who are now trying to lead you in this remote virtual one-on-one world where they're exhausted by it. So they're just feeling really depleted in that group. Um, And so the idea that they're just wanting more more work-life balance, they just want a different experience of work that isn't so disengaging and tiring. So you mentioned work-life balance and, you know, a lot of people listening to this might say, well, you know, we have uh, self-care programs, we have health and well-being programs, so our employees aren't going to get burned out because, you know, we're taking care of them. We have yoga and healthy snacks and, you know, meditation apps and stuff like that. Is that not enough to keep all these things from happening? You know, I've been pretty vocal to about just what 
is going to remedy burnout and what is actually going to help people to motivate and optimize. And I think we need all of those things. I don't, I wouldn't say, you know, kick all those programs out of, you know, your strategy. It's just understand that they're going to play a certain function. And so self-care is important. Leaders need to model self-care. They should always, you know, if there's some new wellness program, they should be attending and promoting that it's something that they should, we should all be doing. They should be disconnecting to, they should be taking breaks, taking their vacation and not answering emails on vacation. All those things leaders still need to do. And that is actually establishing a model of, of caring about wellness. But when you're looking at burnout prevention, all of those things aren't tackling systemic discrimination or the disproportionate impact on, on women inside of our workforce, or they're not dealing with, you know, lack of grief and um, policies that are there for all of the people that have dealt with grief over the last two years. It's not tackling, um, you know, compensation structures and, and reward and recognition structures. Like it's not tackling those things. So when we're really looking at well-being when it comes to burnout, we have to look at that as a culture um, strategy uh, effort initiative. And then wellness is a perk. And those are two different things. Like the wellness, those tactics are perks. They're not prevention interventions. They're they're very different. And until we bifurcate that within our you know strategy and look at burnout prevention as a cultural phenomena, then it's just not going to solve the problem. It's like giving ice cream to people who need water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so in the last like 15, 20 minutes or so, we're going to talk about some specific action items around what, what to do. Um, but maybe one or two questions before we get to that point. One, you talk about curiosity in your book and you also talk about empathetic leadership. And so I, I thought maybe we could start with curiosity and why, you know, what does curiosity have anything to do with burnout? Curiosity is maybe my, the, the chapter on curiosity was my favorite one to write. And okay. the research is so, I just find it so compelling. It was really interesting. I had some great chats with Dr. Martha Bird, who's the chief anthropologist for ADP. And what I loved about that conversation was A, the fact that ADP has hired someone into a C-level role that's an anthropologist is incredible. Mm. But just this idea that, you know, we we've stopped being curious and that's making us less empathetic. We're really practicing more perceptual curiosity all the time, which is just scratching itches that don't actually mm. resolve themselves and feeling satisfaction. I mean, we are doomsday scrolling on social media constantly. We're looking at the news all the time in the pandemic. You know, we are just, our media diet was feasting on news that wasn't going to make us feel better. And, what we weren't doing was actually just practicing epistemic curiosity and philosophy, this idea that we should be learning for learning's sake and, and you know, spending time just appreciating that there's other parts of the world that make us more macro instead of so myopic. And we do, we're getting like that societally, but inside of organizations, there's a lot of myopathy. And when we practice this constant myopathy of like, can I get news that's going to satisfy what I need to know right now about me to help me and my life, instead of saying broadly, okay, let's be out in nature and appreciate moments of awe. Let's have spiritual rest where we actually, you know, connect to the the world that has been around for a really long time and has endured a lot of terrible things. And, you know, my stuff isn't the most important piece. And you see that in organizations that have much more, you know, curious cultures. They care about other stories. They dig deeper. They listen. They find out what lights people up and they they promote that by following up on that and asking more questions and they learn about that that person they learn ab about that person enough that if that person is starting to kind of um become burned out or sort of decompose in this current environment you're aware of it much earlier than than that point where it's the drop dead date for someone like you're paying attention and that allows us also to connect with people to create sparks and to be creative and to innovate and be competitive. So it's a building up of just being slightly more interested in other human beings mm -hmm. so that you can then, you know, grow as an organization, but your culture really shifts if you behave in that way. Yeah. And, and I guess that ties very well into this theme of empathetic leadership, which is something we've been hearing about quite a bit. Uh, and I, I think we're doing a little bit of a better job at this than we have been, you know, over the past few years. But this idea of trying to put yourself in your employees' shoes 
leading by example, which is one of the things that you alluded to earlier, right? I mean, I think one of the best ways that you can get your employees to avoid burnout is if you demonstrate as a leader what those behaviors should be, like disconnecting, taking your vacation time, you know, having that kind of balance. Because if your people see you burned out and working out all the time, they're going to assume that that's culturally the way that things should be. Uh, you know, and in fact, it's a little deceptive if you look at a lot of job descriptions when you apply to work there and they say it's like 32 to 40 hours a week and you end up working like 50, 60. It's like, yeah. if you would have told me that, I would have never taken this job to begin with. Exactly. Uh, so I, I think we'll see some interesting change uh, start to happen. Um, but let's use the last, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes or so to talk about some specific action items. Have you subscribed to Leading the Future of Work Plus yet? If not, I highly encourage you to do so. In fact, if you subscribe right now, you're going to get a bonus episode from Jennifer, which looks at how leaders can measure burnout for themselves and their teams, strategies to use to keep burnout from happening, and techniques to use to combat burnout for if and when it actually happens. The best part of all this, it's only $4.99 a month or $49.99 a year to subscribe. And not only will you get this amazing bonus episode from Jennifer, but you're going to get a bonus episode each week from one of my amazing guests. On top of that, you're going to get ad-free listening, early access to new episodes, and it's less than the cost of a cup of coffee a month. How can you possibly say no to that? I hope you decide to subscribe and support the show.